He is CEO of the consultancy Disaster Avoidance Experts, which specializes in teaching how to avoid dangerous threats and missed opportunities. Gleb has over 20 years of consulting, coaching, speaking, and training experience with mid-size and large organizations. And his research background has been as a behavioral scientist. His books include Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. The Blind Spots Between Us, How to Overcome Unconscious Cognitive Bias and Build Better Relationships, and Returning to the Office and Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams, a manual on benchmarking to best practices for competitive advantage. And that is a recent publication, very relevant to a lot of our work right now. Dr. Spursky has been featured in over 550 articles and 450 interviews in publications including Fortune, USA Today, Inc., CBS News, Time, Business Insider, Government Executive, The Chronicle of Philanthropy, and Fast Company. His PhD is from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he was a professor at Ohio State University, and he currently lives in Columbus, Ohio. So with that, Gleb, please take it away. Thank you very much, really appreciate it. All right, and you should be all be able to see me and I look forward to this presentation. So I'll let you know what the shape of the presentation will be like. First, we'll talk about the typical judgment errors that we make because of how our mind is wired. So you are engineers, electrical engineers, technical folks, and you need to understand how your mind is wired. You generally focus on technical subjects, but our decision-making is so important in everything that we do, whether it's you as a consultant figuring out your relationship with a client, how you serve a client in the best manner, whether it's you figuring out how to help a client do well or working on your business. And if you're just thinking about the consulting field, trust me, these are topics you'll want to know. Making good decisions in all areas of your work is critical. But we tend to make certain errors, systematic errors in how we make our decisions. And these are called cognitive biases. And I'll be talking about these systematic errors and how to address them throughout the presentation. So the first part of the presentation will be about these errors, cognitive biases, and how we can make recognize them as, so that we make better decisions. The second part of the presentation will be more about how to address them, both by identifying them and then taking specific certain steps to address them. So that's going to be the shape of the presentation. That's what you can anticipate. And as Chris mentioned, we'll be going for the presentation. We'll be going for the first part. Then there will be some questions and answers. I'll ask you to hold your questions until the end. I often find that I answer people's questions throughout the presentation. You can, of course, type them into the chat or put them, if that's convenient for you, so you don't have to hold them and think about them. So that's one way to do it. Or you could just hold them and think about them until the end. All right. So let's talk about your decision-making. Now, you've probably heard that we need to be confident in our decisions. It's important for you to be confident. As a consultant, you want to provide an image of confidence to your client, and you want to make decisions that you then go ahead, implement effectively. It's important to have confidence. You've probably heard this a lot. Now, let's think about decision-making, not simply in our job, but in other areas of life. Let's say in driving. It's valuable to have confidence in driving, and that's important to think about when you're merging onto a highway. You don't want to be going slowly. You want to go fast and merge and quickly. And when you're changing lanes, you want to be confident when you're driving. So I'm going to ask you, when you're thinking about your driving skills, take a look at the poll. So you'll be able to see a poll. How good do you think are your driving skills? Would you say you're in the top half of all drivers or in the bottom half? Are you in the top half or in the bottom half of all drivers? So please go ahead and vote on that. So about 50% participated. Let's give folks another 10 seconds to participate. If you haven't done so yet, make your voice heard.
All right. So we'll see that 92% of us are in the top half of all drivers and 8% of us are in the bottom half of all drivers. So that's the results we get, 92% and 8%. Now, as you can imagine, we should be, if this was accurate, but 50% of us should be in the top half and 50% of us should be in the bottom half. But that's the typical results I get. And I did this in but not only simply in consultants with the IEEE, but uh, I did a webinar for the national IEEE, which is how I got connected to the IEE CCN NSV, so your local branch, similar results, you get these results pretty frequently that folks perceive themselves to be better drivers than they are. And this is important to realize because this is a systematic error. It's called the overconfidence bias, where we tend to perceive ourselves as being better or we're too confident in our skills and our abilities and our driving in our ability to do things at work, to be consultants, to manage our clients, to make that sale, we have a tendency to be way too confident or in the recommendations that we make as consultants. That's a challenge. So you want to realize that when people are very, very confident, when they say they're 100% confident about something, they bet the farm, they bet their career. Well, guess what? They're only right about 80% of the time. 80% of the time. No wonder that Las Vegas can make a lot of money, right? That's a problem for us, that we are wrong one-fifth of the time when we'd be willing to bet pretty much everything on the stakes. This is especially a big problem for people with more experience and more authority. There was a study looking at doctors, comparing senior doctors who are out of medical school for over a decade to those who are just junior doctors just out of medical school. And what the study found was that it was gave them both the same information about a patient case study and had them diagnose the condition and prescribe a course of treatment. Well, the senior doctors and the junior doctors got the prescription and diagnosis right at about the same rate. But the senior doctors were way more confident and therefore less likely to change their minds, order new tests and see if they might be wrong. This is of course a serious challenge. Now, why does this happen? Well. Senior doctors, of course, have more know-how and experience, but junior doctors have fresher information coming out of medical school. So, for example, somebody who is coming out of college, graduate school in engineering, they might have fresher knowledge, whereas people who have know-how might have know-how, right? So there's different ways that people can approach a problem, and just because you're senior doesn't mean you're better. So this is a challenge that people often run into, that overconfidence bias. Those with more experience and more authority tend to have more of a confidence. So that's something to address and watch out for. Now, this is all part of a broader tendency of some dangerous judgment errors. I call them already the systematic errors that we make when we go with our intuitions, when we go with what feels right. You've probably had a lot of these figures who are gurus, Tony Robbins, Malcolm Gladwell, telling you to make your decisions quickly. Malcolm Gladwell tells you to blink, make your decisions in the blink of an eye. Tony Robbins tells you to be primal, be savage. So folks tell you to go with your gut, trust your intuition, follow your heart. Well, you know what? It feels very comfortable to do that. And there's a reason that Tony Robbins and Malcolm Gladwell get paid a lot of money. It feels good. It feels comfortable to be told what we already want to do. And that's how people get paid money, a lot of money. They tell us what we already want to do. That's unfortunately, the research shows it's not a good idea. Our gut often leads us in exactly the wrong direction. It leads us into disastrous decisions. So it's something we really want to be careful about because our gut reactions, our intuitions are actually not evolved for the modern environment. They're evolved for the savannah environment. When we lived in small tribes of 50 people to 150 people, we were hunters, gatherers, and foragers. I mean, think about it. The modern environment with the internet has really been around since 1990s. And this virtual world of work that we're heading into has really been around since the last decade. So this is not something that we are wired for. Our intuitions are going to lead us systematically astray in many areas. And we need to understand that and watch out for that. 
the specific ways that our intuitions lead us astray, the specific dangerous judgment errors that we make are called cognitive biases by scholars in behavioral science. You know a little bit about my background. These are cognitive biases. And they again come from our evolutionary background that just the structure of our brain. Our brain takes low energy roots. It's known as a lazy brain. And therefore we make poor decisions just because of the structure of our brain. Now, I'm gonna ask you if you ever had this experience, whether, whether when you felt that you were very confident that you were right, but you turned out to be wrong. So you felt really confident that you were right, but you turned out to be mistaken. Is that something that you experienced? Okay, I'll give you five more seconds. You haven't participated yet. Okay, so we see that the overwhelming majority of you had that experience. And when you feel that confidence and you turn out to be wrong, that's very likely an example of you falling into one of the many cognitive biases that we experience overconfidence bias and so on. So this is a challenging issue and a lot of you, a great deal of you, the large majority of you have experienced this and I know I have myself. Let's talk about some other dangerous judgment errors that we tend to fall into. One that's really important for engineers to watch out for is called the planning fallacy. The planning fallacy. We tend to underestimate the amount of time and resources, money, coding efforts, social capital that it takes us to accomplish certain projects because we feel that the future will go according to plan. You might have heard the phrase failing to plan is planning to fail. Failing to plan is planning to fail. It's a phrase that unfortunately is somewhat misleading because it impl the implication is that well, if you make a plan, everything will be fine. That's not quite right. The much more accurate phrase that I teach my clients is failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. So again, failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. So you want to not underestimate these risks and threats and the resources that it takes us to address them. And instead plan for problems and build in extra resources time, money, information, resources, social capital, whatever you might need, that might be an issue. So the planning fallacy is a big one that does not serve engineers well. A distinct and related issue is called the normalcy bias. The normalcy bias, this has to do much more with major disruptors, whether disruptors like the COVID pandemic or disruptors like for cybersecurity specialists, disruptors like a major, major virus that and, and so on. So many of these dynamics that we don't think about, you know, like the pandemic, the 2008, 2009 fiscal crisis, I mean, the rise of a smartphone is itself a major disruptor. We tend to greatly underestimate these major disruptors. We have an intuition that things will keep going normally as they are right now. And we underestimate the extent to which the future changes, which is understandable from the Savannah perspective, because in the Savannah environment, things weren't going to change very much. We needed to, it was going to be, well, the change of the season, spring, summer, fall, winter. That was the major change. And here in the modern world, we have many, many more disruptors, as I mentioned, but we underestimate the likelihood and the impact of these disruptors. We see the future as mostly in being like the past. So this is a big problem for us, the normalcy bias. Now, let's talk about the next step. So I gave you some examples, the overconfidence bias, the planning fallacy, the normalcy bias. Let's talk more broadly about how you assess these dangerous judgment errors. And here to figure out, so we're moving into the second part of the presentation. How can you recognize they're there? 
how can you know that they're there and take steps to address them? Well, you can use the assessment and dangerous judgment errors in the workplace. There are over 100 cognitive biases. You can take a look at the list of cognitive biases in the Wikipedia to learn more about them. The assessment itself, I've developed it to focus on the 30 most dangerous cognitive biases in professional settings, including for you as consultants and engineering professionals, information service professionals. It evaluates the extent and impact on your workplace, what you're doing, and your work internally, on your work with clients, and then provides you with the next steps for addressing them. So it's a very useful tool in that way. Now I'm going to share my screen and you'll be able to, to look at the assessment and we'll go through the assessment. I want you to bring up the chat feature because we'll be using up the chat. Okay, so let's go for the assessment. Now, as you can see, each question, you should be able to see my screen, each question refers to a problem that might occur in everyday professional situations. So you don't need to know anything about cognitive biases to take the assessment. That is not a necessity at all. You just need to know the idea that there are certain problems that might occur in professional situations. Your goal is to indicate how often these problems occurred as a percentage of all the times when they might have occurred. So think about how often they could have occurred in your workplace over the past year, and you want to give a percentage of all the times that they actually occurred. You can focus it on your own workplace. You can focus on a unit, on a team, on your client. I recommend starting just with the one that you know best, your own workplace, your own work team, and using that. Don't overthink it. Each question should take 10, 15, 20 seconds at most. So just give your initial impression of this percentage. So let's go through several of these so you get an impression of what they are like. Question one, what percentage of projects missed the deadline or went over budget? Seventy percent, a hundred percent, seventy-five percent, fifty percent, fifty, ninety percent, sixty percent, fifty percent, ninety, eighty percent, ninety, seventy, fifty, twenty, forty percent, ninety-nine, ninety, hundred percent. So we see that pretty high numbers here. So this, of course, refers to the planning fallacy, where we tend to underestimate the amount of resources and time and/or time necessary to accomplish of certain projects. And if you are in the 20 to 30% range, that's reasonably normal, not too disruptive. If you're getting into the 30 and above, that becomes more of a problem. If you're in the 40 and especially 50% range, that becomes a really serious issue because you're not directing your resources in the right way. And there's certainly clear -ish serious issues with your plan if you're having these so sorts of overruns of time and money and or money. So you really want to be thinking about, okay, if you are getting 30 and especially 40% on these questions and this one and similar, this applies to all others, then you want to definitely bring this information back to your team and work on this issue. Let's go to number two. Number two, out of all the team conflicts, so think about the team conflicts that occurred. So all the team conflicts that occurred, how many of them occurred because someone overestimated how effective they are communicating and persuasiveness? So 60%, 10%, 25, 20, 80%, 80%, 50%, 80%, 20, 60%, 20%, 50%. 40%, 80 percent, 50%. 30%. Okay. 30%. Yes. Oh, I think there's somebody who accidentally unmuted themselves. Please mute yourself. Thank you very much. Great. And 60% the last one. Great. So this refers to a cognitive bias known as the illusion of transparency. 
illusion of transparency. We tend to perceive ourselves as effective communicators. We tend to feel that we're getting across 100% of our message. And we tend to forget that other people may mishear us. So may have just, it may be a technical issue, whether it's because we're doing remote work or someone's distracted. It might be an issue of misunderstanding. They might hear us, but they might not interpret our words correctly. Maybe because they're distracted or maybe because they have different understanding of terms or maybe they're not liking what they're hearing. So they're kind of ignoring part of it. And then they might, he, they might hear it accurately and they might, un, they might understand it, but they might disagree. They might still be nodding their head as though, yes, yes, that's right. Your client might be nodding their head like, yes, that's right. But they might not be agreeing with you at all, but they do not want to have a conflict if they're conflict avoidant. So this, there are a number of series of issues that the illusion of transparency can bring about and that result in serious team conflicts. Let's go to number three. And Carolyn says that senior, certain senior executives don't take responsibility for communicating effectively, unless, unfortunately, you're absolutely right. And this is one of the reasons that consultants are needed. All right. Of all significant decisions, in what percentage of cases was someone overconfident about the decision? Please go ahead. Overconfident. So in what percentage of cases was someone, at least one person, overconfident about the decision? 30, 80%, 40, 90%, 20, 50, 100%, 10%, 20, 90, 60, 70%. So again, 40% and above, 30% and especially 40% and above, you definitely want to address this. So 100%, 80%. So this of course refers to the overconfidence bias. We talked about this, this is definitely a challenging issue that you want to make sure to address. Let's go on to number four. Of all situations when someone had evidence that would contradict their beliefs or clear information that would disprove their interpretation of the situation, in what percentage of cases did they ignore the evidence or misinterpret the information? 10%, 30%, 70%, 50, 20%, 20%, 10%. Another 10%, 40, 20%. Oh, let's not get into politics, Ellen. <laughs> 50%, 30%. Carolyn says the higher the rank, the higher the percentage. That I've definitely seen that to be a challenge. 30%, Ryan says. So this refers to cognitive bias called the confirmation bias where we tend to look for information that confirms our beliefs and ignore information that does not confirm our beliefs. This is definitely one of the bigger challenges that we face in terms of information gathering and how we deal with and process information. I like this one, number five. So think about situations where People should have been really dealing with a difficult or uncomfortable issues, but they focused on trivial issues instead. This often happens where in a meeting you have really big issues to deal with, but people really focus more of their time on smaller, easier to solve issues that are not nearly as important or you know, committee groups doing the same sort of thing. 85%, 90%, 90%, 70%, 10%, 20%. 80%, 80%, 10%, 80%. This seems in the higher end, 70%, 40, 20, 30, 40, over 80%. This is a cognitive bias called bike shedding or the law of triviality. It has two names. So bike shedding comes from a story where there was a group of people who had to design the plans and for a nuclear plant and they spent an inordinate amount of time on a bike shed next to the nuclear plant compared to the nuclear plant plants. So that, that was the association with bike shedding. So this is definitely a challenging issue that should be, you want to make sure to address. And let's do one more. When a potential or current employee was evaluated, in what percentage of cases 
was the evaluation too positive due to factors not relevant to their job competency or organizational fit? So factors not relevant to their competency or fit in the organization, in what percentage of the cases was the evaluation too positive? Please go ahead. 50%, 80%, 30%, another 30%, 10%, 30%, 75%, 30%. Forty percent. Fifty percent, forty percent. So this refers to a cognitive bias called the halo effect. So um, the, the halo effect refers to the fact that when we like someone, when we like so, a characteristic of someone, some characteristic of someone, we tend to overvalue them as a whole. And Carolyn is right, when they're most likely, the evaluator is when it's most likely to happen because this relates to tribalism. So the more characteristics a person shares with us, the more we tend to like them, not in all cases, but in general, the average is the case. And we tend to overvalue all of their other characteristics, even if it's something trivial, like which sports team they root for. Mm -hmm. So yes, the halo effect, it, the sales gets it from the cognitive bias research. It's the, for that background. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so that's the assessment. Now I'm curious, now that you've taken a look at the assessment, do you think it would be valuable for you and your team to take the assessment and address the cognitive biases that it, it uncovers? Please go ahead and vote on that. So about just over half of you voted. We'll give you five more seconds to make your voice heard. Great, so four-fifths of you see it as valuable. That's great to hear. I'll be sending out these resources to those who want them. You'll be able to vote in a Zoom poll whether you want the resources. The assess copy of the assessment will be part of the resources. Great, let's talk about a way to solve them. So the first way of, of addressing cognitive biases, of course, is to identify them using this assessment. And the assessment has some next steps for working on them, choosing which ones to work on. So the first step to do is have your team take the assessment. They see a large majority of you think it will be valuable. That's great. You can take the assessment yourself. You can bring it to your team or you can just do it together. Now, what about actually controlling for these cognitive biases, addressing them. A great way to do so is a five question method to make decisions that are not going to be disastrous. It's for good enough decisions, decisions that you don't want to screw up, whether you as an individual or a group making decisions together. This is an excellent method to make sure that you don't screw up decisions. And that can be decisions as, you know, sort of light as writing an email to your client that you want to make sure to not screw up. It can be decisions about how to structure a meeting, how to do an activity, of course, how to do, have some deliverables for a client, how to do internal work within your own organization for yourself, not for your client, how to collaborate with other people, networking, all of these sorts of things that you don't want to screw up. You make these kinds of decisions you know, five to 10 times a day that you don't want to screw up. And this is a method that takes a couple of minutes once you learn about it, that you apply. So it takes only a couple of minutes if the method is right. And if it's wrong, you definitely want to take more time. Five questions to avoid decision disasters. First question, what important information didn't I yet fully consider? So confirmation bias and other cognitive biases cause us to look for information that confirms our beliefs, which is a problem. You want to look for information that you didn't fully consider. Try to prove yourself wrong. So look for information that shows that you're wrong. That's the information that we're not likely to consider. If you, can, if you can't prove yourself wrong, that's great. You're more likely to be right. 
If you can prove yourself wrong, that's great too, because then you're not going to make a bad decision. Another part of this question is important information. You don't want to fall into analysis paralysis and look for random information. Decide what information is important before you go and look for it, if at all possible, so that you don't get stuck in un getting unnecessary information. Next, what dangerous judgment errors didn't I yet address? So which of these cognitive biases didn't you yet consider? Again, we tend to make serious errors when we fall into these cognitive biases when we don't think about them. The halo effect or the, its opposite, the horns effect might be relevant when evaluating people. When, making, when planning a project, the planning fallacy, the normalcy bias might be playing problematic roles. Once you go for the assessment a couple of times, you'll learn about these cognitive biases. It has the information about them at the end. So you'll be able to quickly bring these to mind. What would a trusted and objective advisor suggest I do? So think about that person who would be this angel on your shoulder. What would they suggest you do in this situation? What would you tell a friend who you trust in such a situation who you want to give good advice to? So step outside of yourself. That's very helpful to get that outside perspective. And then of course, if call the person who has, who would be your mentor figure. So whether it's a fellow consultant, whether it's someone who is a peer, maybe someone who is in your chapter. So get their advice and take on things or more important decisions. Next, how have I addressed all the ways this could fail? So think about the ways that this process, this activity, this decision can fail. Imagine that it completely failed. Now think about, well, what can you do in advance to prevent these failures? What led to these failures and what can you do in advance to prevent them? And finally, what new information would cause me to revisit this decision? What would cause you to shift your perspective, to change your mind about this? We tend to become stuck after we make a decision. It's called post-factum rationalization. We rationalize our decisions. You want to figure out, okay, what information would cause me to change my mind? And then use that to figure out, okay, I made this decision, but I will change my mind and revise it if I get this new information. So here's an example. I was mentioning writing an email to clients. I was just writing an email to a client earlier today. So let's use that example. What important information didn't I yet fully consider? So I was trying to get a client to do something that is a little bit of a hassle for the client to do, but that the client really should realize is in their own best interest. And of course, I realize it's in their interest. What didn't I yet consider? As I was going through the email, I finished it and then I looked, went through the five-step process. Well, I didn't really fully consider why the client might not want to do this thing. And it's some emotional discomfort. So it's a difficult conversation. And so that emotional discomfort is something that I didn't fully consider. So I addressed this in the email saying, hey, I understand this will be an uncomfortable conversation, but it's going to be really valuable for you going forward, not to keep allowing this sort of thing to occur. Dangerous judgment errors. So the illusion of transparency was definitely a major one where I might have miscommunicated. So I was looking out for that and correcting it, editing the email to address it and a couple of others. A trusted and objective advisor. So I stepped outside of myself and I looked at this from an outside situation and seeing, okay, what's the situation? What's the client intentions? What are my intentions? How does this appear to the client? What's the relationship like? So thinking about that. Next, how have I addressed all the ways this could fail? Well, the client can be distracted. The client can be in a negative mood. I'm asking the client to do something a little bit emotionally difficult. So I read the email as to the client may be distracted in a bad mood and edited it to really avoid any sort of pressure or negative information, kind of um, negative attitude that could be perceived as pressuring the client. What new information would cause me to revisit this decision? Well, if the client doesn't respond to me in a timely manner, usually the client responds to me within a day. Now I set myself a timeline of, okay, if the client doesn't respond to me in three days, I will text the client and see what's up. And if I didn't do that, and this is a tricky email and the client didn't respond to me, didn't respond to me, I'd get increasingly anxious and worried and what's happening. 
But now I have a clear timeline. It's three days, client doesn't respond to me. I know what I'm going to do. So that's a way of implementing this five question method to avoid decision disasters. Now, what do you think of this methodology? Do you think it would be valuable for you to use this and for your team to use this? And by the way, to be clear, this is a great for team decision making. So you want to make a decision on a team as a team, let's say you can do this as part of a client team. If you're guiding the client for a certain process, you can do this as within your own consulting firm when you're you and several of your, if, you have, if you're not a solopreneur, if you have several other people as you're going through a process, just have everyone have this information ready and answer it before coming to a meeting about any decision-making meeting. And then just go structure the agenda around these five questions and just go through it. And I can guarantee to you, it will cut down a lot of time on unnecessary tangents and circling back to issues. It really gets you to a very efficient place. And you can be confident that the decision will not be screwy or much less likely to be screwy. Now, what do you think of this methodology, adopting it for yourself and your team uh, for good enough decisions that you don't want to get wrong? See about just under half of you participated. Have the rest of you have a chance to make your voice heard? All right, just over half of you by now. So I'll give you five more seconds. Okay, so we see that this is definitely popular, more somewhat more popular than the assessment. That was at 80% and this is at 89%. So that's great. Start using it yourself and bring it to your team and they will send you resources to use this in your context. All right. Let's see. Okay, so now we'll go on to breakout rooms. We will have 10 minutes to discuss what insights you had about these cognitive biases and how you can use this information to improve your work, your own work. Whether that's with your clients, whether that's inside your own company. So that is the goal of the discussion. So you'll get together in breakout groups and you will have that discussion. And so like I said, it'll be 10 minutes and after 10 minutes there will be a countdown timer of 60 seconds where you will be able to see the time so you'll know that it's coming up you don't need to leave the room just know that the time is kind of counting down so wind up the discussion and after we have the breakout rooms we'll have a broader conversation about these topics okay so in you'll be able to see that the rooms are open please go ahead and join them and have these discussions. Okay. If you have any questions, if anything is unclear, you can ask me, but in general, just go ahead, join the room, talk about these topics. And if anyone of you has any technical issues, let me know.
So for folks who are remaining here, hopefully don't have any, you're not having any challenges. Let me know if you're having technical issues. Hale, was there a question that uh, you weren't certain about? I, uh, somebody asked for help in this room. Okay, it doesn't seem so. Oh, okay. I was yes. using iPad today. It's, it's different, completely different interface. I didn't know how to unmute myself. So okay. I have a one one chat chat room the roommate Roger. Do we what are we supposed to uh, to do exactly? I'm sorry. You're supposed you're supposed to discuss how you can implement these techniques in your own work and how they can be helpful. So learning okay, about these cognitive it. biases. Mm -hmm. Okay. Roger, you. do you have any questions? Let's see, Roger. I hope Roger is able to unmute himself because I'm not sure he's able to unmute himself. But uh, anyway. Oh yeah, okay. So here okay. I am. There you go. Okay, so go ahead, discuss. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome.
we're mostly back. Just give folks a little bit more time. They're finishing up. Okay, I think we're pretty ready. Great, all right, everyone. So I'd like you to share any insights that you realized from these conversations that you think might be helpful. So please go ahead. You can unmute yourself or you can share in the chat whatever is more convenient to you. So mute yourself or share in the chat your insights from these discussions. My, my, the only thing, this is Glenn Hansen. The only thing I was going to share is okay. I heard a similar talk. Uh, I'm a quality engineer, and a quality engineer is talking about basically um, failure proofing your risk analysis. Mm -hmm. And so it's very similar, but I do like your five questions because I think that's simpler to ask the team and say, you know, you know, what can you do? And, and by the way, I, I also shared we had a buyout during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So what you know? What's the one thing they didn't you know? They didn't address number four. The mm -hmm. buyout team came back, or the first assessment team, you know, to, to adopt our technology, came went back home and promptly was sick with COVID. <laughs> they <laughs> lost a month. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that, and that oh, I'm I'm glad. Yeah, these questions are very quick. Once you get used to doing them by yourself, it takes a couple of minutes, and again for a team, it, it it's a very brief time to do and very helpful to address these sorts of problems that you point out. Thank you, Glenn. Other folks, your feedback, your comments. I'm very familiar with a lot of these ideas. I think that a friend of mine used to have an expression, you know, knowing is the booby prize. The question is the doing, as Yoda yes. said. You know, there is do and no do. That's all there is. <laughs> Otherwise, you don't get results. And, you know, you try something and you check the results out. So that's a whole other <laughs> issue. And I have met even myself, I know a lot of these techniques, but I don't use them in the mm -hmm. moment, that is. Like it's yeah. easy to watch tennis and know how to do it better, but it's very difficult to do it when you're playing the game. Mm -hmm. Thank you, I appreciate that. Yes, that's why I strongly recommend bringing the assessment and using the assessment. It's a really good way of helping yourself and your team see what your problems are, what your challenges are. And once you can have emotional investment and buy-in into the challenges, then you can start to take, okay, then I really need to solve them. And so that is a really good approach. So having the assessment and then taking the next steps based on that. I have a comment or um, some yes. of the small teams or startups are generally a lot more unstructured and they're the people who need more analysis and decision making. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, basically overcome these biases, but they don't, they're fighting too many fires, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, the bigger corporations have more processes and procedures. They may be more willing to put this as part of their structure, but the guys who really need are the small companies, but the dilemma is uh, it, how to convince them. And basically the, the startups can benefit a lot more. Again, I'm using mm -hmm. startups as a placeholder or example, sure. but it can apply to many situations. The people oh. who really need are not mm -hmm. willing to spend the time. That's my point. Hmm. Oh, well, okay. So two aspects of the question. I work to, in companies as diverse, uh, ranging from Aflac to Xerox in terms of Fortune 500 companies. My last client was a large company, is a Fortune 200 company called Applied Materials that does high-tech manufacturing. So I'm sure there are some IEE members in it. And uh, that's a large company that was implementing, it found it quite valuable to implement some of these methods because they were not using some of these methods before and cognitive bias is not one. Right now, and uh, there are many entrepreneurs who implement these methods, so startup founders, I've, uh, one of my recent clients was a large, mature late stage startup. It's a unicorn. It was 1.4 billion at the time that I worked for them that was implementing these methods. Right now I'm working with the University of Southern California to implement these 
for their Vittori B School of Engineering, so again, from IEE. So there's a lot of different companies and organizations that are implementing these. And what you find is that entrepreneurs definitely do find these, and startups definitely do find these methods helpful if they realize the importance of working on the business, not only in the business. And that's usually entrepreneurs who had a previous failure or two and realized that, okay, they can just go around long and run full barrel and think they'll, everything will be good. Uh, there was a question I wanted to address. Carolyn asked about the works on uh, Robert Cialdini, influence and persuasion. Yeah, a great researcher and he writes good books. So I think that his overlaps obviously with the these issues. I don't focus so much on sales training and persuasion. That's not my area of expertise. I focus on decision-making and bias. But his area is quite respectable. I've read his books, and I think that the, he definitely has a lot of valuable insights. Uh, Glenn says that he has seen managers implement solution. They tested the positive cases, but not the failures. Yes, that's why the first question is, what important information didn't I yet fully consider? So how can you prove yourself wrong? You want to try to prove yourself wrong? If you can't, that's you're more likely to be right. But if you can, then you definitely want to do that. Okay, other folks. I see there's other comments in the chat, but nothing I think I, I can contribute. Other folks, other comments, other insights from the discussions. So I, I'm uh, interested in the question of uh, uh, how did it how to determine that that these kind of considerations weren't made uh, as part of an accident investigation. Um, mm -hmm. That um, I, I'm I'm not sure that I can do that without actually being able to talk to the people. But and and some of the stuff I'm doing, I the people I need to talk to were long past. Uh, gone. So, and uh, so uh, one example is uh, these guys aren't long past gone, but I don't have access to them. At, at Fukushima, they decided uh, not to use the most uh, uh, recent estimates about our um, earthquakes. Yeah. All right. And uh, one could say, yeah, they didn't. They didn't decide to do that. They didn't. They should have thought about that more. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the, the the answer might have been, well, that earthquake is a one in a ten thousand event, mm -hmm. and our plant is uh, only going to run for another seven years. Mm -hmm. So why should I? Why should I? Why should we build a, a great big new uh, system mm -hmm. to protect against this? So is there, are there tells that you can get through uh, uh, reading, uh, uh, reading the, re the uh, accident reports mm -hmm. or something like that? Yes, I think the best tells would be if there are smaller accidents, smaller issues near misses. So if you are seeing that there are near misses, if you're seeing that in previous history, that there are issues with organization, that safety is not being quite followed, which when I looked at the Fukushima so I, I do look, I, I, I work with nuclear companies, Entergy is one of my clients. And when looking at Fukushima, from my understanding of the situation, they did not follow a number of regulations where they, <laughs> or best practices, let's say that, where, where they should have. So you want to look at whether there are near misses, whether there are minor accidents, minor issues going on. And that should tell you that the large accident was not a completely one-off weird scenario. It was an indication of a number of other problems that were cropping up. And so that is the kind of things that you want to be looking for. I yeah, that... well, I mean, that was, uh, that, that was uh, uh, very clear, but it could have been a very rational decision too, to say, oh, I've got a 10-year 
I've got I've got a plant that's only going to sit here for another ten years, mm -hmm. but the accident probability is uh, a thousand years, and uh, the probability of an accident that large is only a thousand years. Right. So, so you want to estimate the probability and the impact. Yeah. One is the probability. One is the impact. What is the impact if that yeah. happens? And the impact is incredibly outsized <laughs> in terms of not simply people. I mean, I think it was. There were most the the vast majority. I think only one person died of cancer. The vast majority of the people who died died because of the evacuation. Yeah. But the consequence was, I mean, that was kind of a panic response. But still, a lot of people died. The consequence was the shutting down of nuclear plants in Japan, in Germany, in Taiwan, in many many other places. That I mean, that's a incredibly huge loss for not simply the nuclear industry, but for the world. Think about the climate change damage that was caused by all of these closing. Think about the jobs lost and all of these other problems. That's an incredibly high impact. So maybe it's, it's a low probability of occurrence, but the, it's kind of, it, it's, it relates to the normalcy bias where we underestimate the likelihood and the probability, the likelihood and the impact. So you want to combine those to evaluate what you should be actually doing and addressing things. Yeah, well, so if I, I, I worked at IAEA for a number of years and, oh, and yeah. uh, uh, I, I was never very happy with the, uh, well, when I got to know the right, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Japanese regulators, I was not impressed. Hmm. Uh, but uh, apparently on the day before the event, the Japanese regulators were there talking to the plant people saying, you know, you need to be thinking about this because we're going to make you do this pretty pretty soon. Hmm. Just a little bit late to the late to the ball game. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Anyone else wants to share any insights they had? I just, I just wanted to mention that yes, Carolyn. Um, if one got the team to incorporate these questions as part of their process, yep. um, that could be a way of being able to raise questions without the political consequences mm -hmm. uh, sometimes. So I can see this, if it were adopted as part of the process, then you'd have a way of discussing concerns that people had that they may not feel comfortable raising, especially if it's a, it's a more senior person who's just blithely saying, oh, we should do it this way. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> damn the consequences, and not taking responsibility for <laughs> consequences, et cetera. So. That's a really important insight, Carolyn. And as when I work with clients, I have them very much integrate this as part of their decision-making process and so that they can always have these conversations. Just it's a standard part of the process and it's weird if you didn't do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that, it's the norm. Oh, thank you. Because that that make, once it's part of the process, then it's accepted and comfortable yes. and people think nothing of it. And so, and it gives you a framework to raise questions that people may, especially, I don't know if you know the, what, what happened with um, Boeing and the L-1011 engines and stuff. Yeah. Okay, that, yeah. because it, there was no way for the engineers to get the information. And of course the Challenger uh, shuttle disaster. Oh I yeah, mean, that, that was just really bad. <laughs> yeah. Yep, when the rushing, when rushing the decision for political reasons, yeah. When you're not following a process, yep. Yep. Yeah, so. Yeah. We're, we're on the same page. Yeah, so this, this is great that you have a, a vehicle, a framework mm -hmm. to teach people that once it becomes part of the process, then it's it's enormously helpful because organizations are, are living entities and the organization itself needs to be cultivated, totally mm -hmm. aside from the technology or anything else. Yeah. The culture, yep, yes. absolutely. Exactly, thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. Yeah. Gary, you had another point to make? Oh, I was going to say, you know, the, the, the process you talk about is one that has been used for years and years and years, but it's it's very, um, especially in high hazard industries, but it's, it's uh, I, I think uh, 
your your list here is a good checklist. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there's a need to pull people out of their cut comfort zone mm -hmm. and think about the things, try to think about the things that they can't uh, think about. Yeah. But, I, but I also uh, believe that there is a limit to this mm -hmm. and I don't know where it is. I, for a long time, I thought it was, you could get to about 10 to the minus six uh, hazard. Um, but I think that's too high. I think it's probably by the time you get to a 10 to the minus four event, you're probably at a point that you have, don't really have the capability to understand what are the things that I'm not thinking about that mm -hmm. I should be thinking about. Yeah, I think it depends on the combination of importance and probability, like we talked about with the impact. So you want to be thinking about both of those sorts of dynamics. But yes, the crucial thing that I think the methodology that I'm talking about brings is having people not simply say, okay, this is a checklist that I have to go through, but understand deeply that we are all flawed, that we all have these cognitive biases, and that's why. So internalize the idea that our thinking is by its nature, by human nature, screwed up in a number of ways. And these systems and processes help us address this. But if you don't have that first component, which is why I presented about the cognitive biases first, a lot of people will cut corners and skip aspects of this process if they don't internalize and accept that our thinking is just inherently not very well oriented and organized. I, I, I actually think um, that just having the, the concept of cognitive bias is an important thing uh, mm -hmm. because we're, uh, we have been doing these things for a long time, but sometimes we forget why we're doing it. Exactly. Yep. Very much so. All right. Great. So yeah, I, had, I had a comment. Uh, yes, please. Go ahead. Carolyn Masters brought up Boeing, and I thought she was going to address 737 MAX, which is a much mm -hmm. more recent problem. And there, mm -hmm. reading a report that was published, I believe, in IEEE Spectrum, someone noted that they moved the engines forward on the wings, which would change basically the thrust center of gravity. I forget the exact phrase, but the way that thrust would be applied to the uh, frame, the wings and everything. And then they were gonna use software to hide that fact. Oh. And that was, the software was called MCAS. And lo and behold, the software had bugs <laughs> and two planes crashed. Okay. You can imagine so how much money that cost Boeing in addition to their reputation, oh, yeah. of course. Part Huge. of that was training. Um, the, the interesting thing is American pilots are taught to fly the airplane. The, um, the pilots in other countries, however, are taught to go through, to rely on the computer. And if the computer fails, they are totally lost. In fact, somewhere on my desk, I have a pin that says, in case of emergency, fly the plane. And <laughs> as a pilot, as a pilot, you know, we are taught here in this country in a totally different way than in South Asia. In South Asia, th that one pilot had 200 hours. I had 200 hours by the time I had 17. <laughs> I mean, you, you wouldn't even be, be let anywhere near an airplane of that type in this country. It, it's just, so the, the whole thing, and it's, it's a shame because it's a really great airplane and it got a bad rap because when there was a bug in the software, if it had been an American pilot, they would have flipped off MCAS and just hand flown the plane. But the pilot had no clue how to hand fly the plane. He mm. flew the MCAS. So, you know, it's an interesting concept. Yeah, the so it sounds like, so just uh, it's so it sounds like Boeing did not consider who its customers were <laughs> in this case sufficiently 
And that's very unfortunate. They didn't consider how poor the training was. Right. So which, of course, they should have because they ship to, they, they, they should know what kind of training people are getting who are flying their planes. Yeah. But, but you know, it was a case in the, in the U.S. for a very long time. It was a case that, uh, that, that the plane should be, uh, sh should fly well without a lot of, of control changes. Um, it should be stable plane. And uh, what they did is built an unstable plane and tried to make up for that with software. Mm -hmm. And that works great if you're a, an Air Force pilot. But the other thing they did is that, um, uh, and I can't really, uh, I can't really uh, uh, believe they did this is that um, the, the, the system that was uh, doing the uh, uh, dynamics was a one out of one system, oh, uh, no but backup. you could. But then you could buy a one out of two system if you wanted. It. And uh, the Americans, I think, bought one out of two systems. Uh, hmm. But it's also true that the that that, that the uh, Still. American pilots are pretty good. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I mean, yeah, there was a single point of failure on the plane. That is what you're also referring to. They had a single sensor fail and uh, you could no longer fly the plane. Well, you could, you just had to hand fly it. <laughs> and if you didn't trust yourself to hand fly it, the plane was going down. Yeah, but you, you had to know that, understand what, it, you know, it, it, you're right that there was, a, was a, uh, a, a, a part of bias, but uh, I mean, a part of uh, 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 a training, but, uh, that some of these uh, plane, some uh, uh, the uh, aircraft that went down, that uh, uh, they they couldn't even control it uh, because they got into the bad situation faster than faster than they could understand what the situation was. And so one of the problems they had was they got into the bad situation, and the the remedy to that was to take was to disengage and go to manual mode. What they did was they disengaged, went to manual mode, went back to the computer. Computer failed again. And they kept mm -hmm. going back to the computer until they had no altitude and they were, you know, flat all over the countryside. So they were toast. It could have yeah. been an American pilot. You know, you try twice and that's it. I'm hand flying the sucker. I'm not, to, you know, I, I'm gonna take, take control of it and bring it in. I thought there was also a business problem with this, that they, Boeing essentially say, said that you did not need new training. It worked like the old system because otherwise the pilots would have to go back through remedial um, flight training to before they could take the new system in. And so there was some type of statement that they didn't need to do this. And so pilots didn't go through the uh, flight simulator training with this? Well, they went through the sims, but they didn't go through a, a total retraining. They just went through incremental training. And, you know, I've seen the, my nephew flies the 737 for uh, United and he's flo he flies the Max. So I'm fairly comfortable with it. Uh, but it, um, again, it depends on where the pilot is coming from. The mm -hmm. pilots in this country, the couple hours they got in Sims was enough. Whereas even coming from a, a, a ground zero point, um, the foreign pilots uh, didn't have enough training to handle it, or they didn't have enough confidence in their training. Yeah, that, like I said, the one pilot only had 200 hours. That being said, um, uh, you're, you're, you're quite right, but uh, in a, in a, in a uh, 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 a system such as this, I have. Uh, I would rather. I would rather be protected by, by physics than be protected by software. <laughs> that's that's a good way of phrasing it. And we all know that. Uh, well, I don't know how many folks know that the Boeing has acknowledged deceiving the the FAA in a number of ways in trying to get its 
the Air 737 approved. So we, we know some shady business went on. It's not simply American pilots. Boeing does have some blame for the situation, pretty serious blame in terms of no, knowledge that there were some issues. Yeah, I posted a link to the IEEE Spectrum oh, article. Thank you. Oh, good. Ah, very interesting. And what, when I first mentioned this, I had I misspoke. I meant to say the Lockheed's L-1011 with Rolls-Royce engines that didn't pass the chicken test. Now, this is going back a lot more years, I think, to the 1970s or something. So um, the engine, the Rolls-Royce engines, because of the, um, the materials they were made out of, uh, a jet engine has to take a flock of birds in through the engine and spit bones out the back and still fly. And um, the I think the graphite that the uh, blades were made out of in the Rolls Royce engine that Lockheed had specced in, uh, couldn't do that. <laughs> and it took them a couple of years before they. So basically, they they lost ground to the to the 747 because they would have come out oh. first, and they lost ground because by the time they finally learned this, you know, they, they were two years behind in their schedule. Because hmm. the engineers no, like, couldn't get the information up and through the organization to the executive. Oh, okay, thank you. It's interesting to note that Airbus did the same thing with raising the engines, but their wing was higher off the ground to begin with than the 737. So when they made the, the larger nacelles, they, um, they didn't have to push it forward on the wing because they had ground clearance. All right, folks. So that was a great discussion. Let's get to finalizing the, the presentation. So the key takeaways that you want to be thinking about as we're coming, oh, let me actually make myself spotlight it. So the key takeaways that you want to be thinking about, and we had this great conversation, you want to think about these cognitive biases, have this awareness, as Gary was saying, this is really important to have this awareness and to convey it to others on your teams. Cognitive biases like the normalcy bias, the planning fallacy, the overconfidence bias, they cause us to make bad decision-making errors. And you want to know about these specific cognitive biases as well as the fundamental principle of cognitive biases. Addressing and assessing these will help you, the assessment on dangerous judgment errors will, will help you with that and you'll get a copy of that. And the five questions to avoid decision disasters is a great technique to figure out and address these problems to prevent them from occurring. Now, the key additional resources, the assessment on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace, I mentioned that, decision aid and the five key questions and sample chapters from my best-selling book, Never Go With Your Gut how pioneering leaders make the best decisions and avoid business disasters. And then if you would like some help integrating this into your work, I'd be happy to do so. I have free coaching slots open. So first come, first serve. Click on the link that you'll get in the email and you will get the coaching session. And now we'll do the same thing for polls for those who want the resources. All right, please go ahead and vote on whether you'd like the resources. And welcome to take... Any additional questions? I know we still have a couple of minutes remaining, so happy to take any more questions. You know, we have a pretty good team of, of, of people who could just get together from time to time and talk about these topics. <laughs> oh, good, excellent. Well, what you'll want to do, I recommend bringing both these assessment and dangerous judgment errors and the five questions to them. It might be useful to take as a whole team to take the assessment and then discuss it. Yeah. So, so uh, your your five areas are that the uh, the long time engineering term is uh, critical safety review. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's good. And you do all those steps. Excellent. Sounds like we don't have any more questions at this point, and we're at the end of our time. Mm -hmm. So unless anybody else wants to jump in here, I'm not seeing anything. Um, I guess there's a final question there in the chat, how to deal with overconfident people who would not listen to others. So, so what you want to do, what you want to do in those sorts of situations is 
help assign probability. So there's a, someone who's overconfident and saying, hey, so you feel that this, this will happen. What's your likelihood that this will happen? And they'll say you know, 90%, 100%. And then see if it does happen, what they're saying will happen. And that way you can keep a track record and show them that they tend to be overconfident and they make poor decisions, of course, if we're overconfident. So that's a really good way of helping people calibrate. If they're not initially listening to you, you will help them calibrate by making them put their predictions down on paper. And that will be a helpful way of going forward. Great, thank you very much, Cleb. Brian sure. here. Um, we've been in communication via email, but I wanna thank you very much for your presentation tonight. Mm -hmm. You're very welcome. All right, everyone. And Henry asks, yeah, so I'll send you those e resources if you voted for them. Great. You have a good day. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you very Bye -bye. much. Bye-bye, everyone. It was great.